We are glad you made it in this morning in the midst of uh, the ice and the fog. Uh, We are uh, glad to be able to worship together here on this Sunday morning. Uh, Every week on your bulletin, there's a little tear-off section that we talk about, a place to put your prayer requests, and if you're a visitor, uh, a place to fill that out and let us know uh, a little bit more information about you. But I want to tell you, it's also a place where you can uh, communicate back to us a number of things. And at the end of the message today, I'm going to give you a whole sort of a list of places where people can serve in the church. And if any of those are of interest to you, uh, that tear-off sheet is a great little place uh, even to have right with you to mark down a thought or a note or to tell us you're willing to serve or volunteer uh, for Martha Jennings' service tomorrow, talking uh, to Chelsea Godfrey, she said, uh, if, if people have a particular dish that you like to make, uh, you let us know that. If there's a dish that every time uh, we have a funeral need in the church, we have a list of people who make particular dishes, and you're just like, I would love to make blank, you, you can fill that in on that little tear-off sheet and let us know, and Chelsea will put you on that list, and that way every time we have a need... Uh, you'll be on that list or we can get in touch with you. Uh, I'm going to give you a number of sort of items like that through the course of the service. And so if something grabs you, I want to encourage you to make sure you fill that uh, slip out. Maybe even right now you want to put your name on it because there's nothing worse than turning in your slip without your name on it. That would be bad. So you might want to put your name on it first. That way no matter what else the Lord leads you to say you'd be willing to do, at least you know you've taken care of that part of it. Uh, This morning we continue in our sermon series entitled Divine Direction, and you can go to our website to watch uh, a series of sermons done by Pastor Craig Rochelle on this topic, uh, as well as watch the sermons we've done here or get more resources. Our goal here at Trinity Evangelical is to know Christ and to make Him known. Uh, That's what we desire to do every week. And this morning we're going to talk about how we do that. And uh, the goal of divine direction is for us to learn how to make faith-filled, God-honoring, life-directing decisions. Because all of us in this room are in a constant place of having to make decisions about how we're following God. I've heard from some of our young adults and college students, uh, folks who are at clear crossroads in their life, people who are going to have to make a decision about what direction they're going. And in those moments of knowing you're having to make a decision, it is good to learn how to say, God, how do I get your direction for where I go? But the danger is that some of you don't think you are in a decision-making position at all. You just figure you're just going from one day to another and you don't have to make any decisions. In fact, some of you are avoiding decisions, hoping that you won't have to make any, right? And I can assure you that not making any decisions is a decision. And so no matter what end of the spectrum you're on, you are in the midst of needing God's divine direction. I want to share with you a little bit about my most influential teacher from my seminary days. The, uh, the man who impacted me the most in this lesson, I want to share with you. I'll come back to him in just a moment because I want to review Uh, what the four divine directions are that we've done so far. If you've been here with us for the last four weeks, uh, we've done start. We did start back on December 31st. Hard to believe that was just four weeks ago. Uh, We did start, we did stop, we did stay, we did go, which means you have sermon whiplash. You're trying to figure out what's God's divine direction, and all we've given you is opposites, right? But there are times in our lives where we need a particular word from God. Some of you were here on December 31st, and you needed God to say into your life, start. Start the direction that you need to go. Some of you came back the next week and needed to hear God say, stop those habits that are taking you away from me. Some of you came back two weeks ago and heard God say, stay where you're at. Stay where I've called you to be. And last week, Chad preached, and we heard perhaps for some God say, go, you can go and trust me to where I've called you to be. All of those are places that you can find a biblical direction and biblical stories that talk about those particular uh, directions. But I don't just want us to be Bible quoters. It's not just a matter of going to the Bible to find what it is that you need in your life at that particular moment. Because we are not called to be people who go to the Bible to shape the Bible to say what we want it to say. That's a great danger to be a Bible quoter and not a Bible reader, right? There's a difference. 
It's one thing to be able to quote your favorite verse. It's another thing to say, what does the Bible say? How does it shape me? And so this morning, we begin a series of three divine directions that then shape those first four as we listen for a word from God. We say, God, how does your word shape me? And so our divine direction for the next three weeks is to talk about how do we serve others? How do we connect with community, with other believers, as well as how do we learn to trust God? You see, if we get these next three weeks right, then we're able to go back to those divine direction, those action steps, and be able to say with confidence, God, I know when you've called me to start, and I know where you've called me to stop. I know how you've called me to stay, and I know where you called me to go. The arc of Scripture calls us to learn to become like Christ. And there is nothing more important in the life of Christ than to teach us how to serve one another. How to serve one another. Now, serving is not generally something that we look highly on. In fact, most of the time we go go places where we look for them to have good service. Have you ever gone to a restaurant and you thought, "I, I hope that nobody comes to my table. I am really looking forward to terrible service here. I don't know if you've done this, but my family went out to a restaurant recently and we sat down and and we got our meal and it was fine and and the waitress came and checked on us and that was fine and then she never came back again. There was was no bill and I was just sitting there and finally I said, I can't believe they're not even going to come back. And my son said, Dad, you just pay on this little machine at the table. Right? You've been to these restaurants, they have a little machine at the table. I thought, I just, that's it? Pretty soon I'm just gonna, I'm gonna say I want a drink and I could order my desserts. There was no living person ever coming back to my table. I, I can't imagine the future of, of my restaurant experience because there's something about real people that we appreciate. But you don't go to a restaurant in hopes of bad service. Quite frankly, you don't come to the church and hope you'd say, you know, I hope, I hope I get to set my own chair up today. I'm really, I'd look forward to that, right? Nobody came here thinking that. We generally are people who seek out those places where we are served. And yet as Christ followers, as we work our way through understanding all of what the gospel calls us to be, we recognize that Christ has called us to pursue greatness for him by serving others. Even as he came to preparing to go to the cross, even as Jesus understood his mission was to serve us by dying on the cross, he tried to teach his disciples the same. And so in Matthew chapter 20, Jesus is having a conversation that begins with with, uh, the mother of uh, James and John, the, the, the mother of Zebedee's sons, it says in Matthew 20, verse 20, right? If you thought there were helicopter parents were new today, they're not. Right? Jesus' disciples, his mother, their mother came to talk to Jesus. Uh, the sons of Zebedee, uh, the mother of the sons of Zebedee came to Jesus with her sons and kneeling down asked a favor of him. What is it you want, he asked. And she said, grant that one of these two sons of mine may sit at your right and the other at the left in your kingdom. You don't know what you're asking, Jesus said to them. Can you drink the cup I am going to drink? We can, they answered. Jesus said, indeed, you will drink from the cup, but to sit at my right or my left is not for me to grant. Those places belong to those for whom they have been prepared by my Father. And when the other ten heard about this, they were indignant with the two brothers. And Jesus called them together and said, you know the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead... Whoever wants to be great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be your slave, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Those words of Jesus were in preparation for his disciples. And if we desire to be his disciples today, we must continue to embrace the message that Christ gives to us, even when it's not the one your mother wants to hear. Right? James and John thought they wanted to be great in the kingdom. Jesus affirms their desire for greatness. But the desire for greatness in the kingdom is a counterintuitive goal. 
Now, counterintuitive is a big word, so let me make sure I give it a little bit of definition for us. Counterintuitive means something that doesn't seem like it would be true. It's contrary to your intuition. It's contrary even to your common sense expectation. And yet, it's true. Uh, Some of you want to be the most important person in your house, right? And the assumption is that if you're the most important person in your house, then when I, I mean you, walk in the door, that everybody should be ready to serve your needs, because that's how you know you're important. That's our common sense expectation. So when I walked in, I mean, when you walked in the door at five and all you had was, you know, nothing, you don't think to yourself, well, I must be the least important person. It is counterintuitive to say, well, in my house, if I want us to be people who love each other, we have to learn to serve one another. That if I'm the most loved person in the house, I also get to be the person who serves the most. That is counterintuitive. And in our sinful nature, we know that we could be taken advantage of. That's the danger. That's the resistance. That's the place where we almost cross that line. We almost say, God, I'd love to serve you. But then we we scoot back because then we say, but I don't want to do underwear the rest of my life. I don't want to be the only person that matches socks. I don't want to be the only person that cooks. And if as together as people of God... We are not aware of one another. If we don't serve each other, then we end up losing that passion and that fire. Can I tell you something, church? Oh, I want us to learn to serve one another. But I don't want any of you, because I'm going to give you a whole list of things that we could do in the church. But the great danger in preaching to the choir here is I don't want any one of you to think that now you've got to do more. Because you've already been serving the coffee bar, you've already been setting up chairs, you've already been out putting salt. Quite frankly, I'm feeling a little guilty even preaching this sermon to y'all. Because there's a whole lot of you who know what servanthood is. But here's what I know, here's counterintuitive logic. Those of you who serve the most, those of you who love Jesus best, don't mind hearing the old, old story again, amen? It encourages us to know that we are not alone in our servanthood, and it encourages us because we find our satisfaction, now listen, we find our satisfaction in serving others. How can the church feed you? That's a question that sometimes uh, we, we hear in the church. Nothing worse for a pastor than to hear somebody say, you know what, I, I've got to go somewhere else because you're not feeding me, right? These, these are the folks Pastor Stewart, these are the folks who, they want to be Lutheran because they thought, they thought Martin Luther put 95 Reese's on the door. Right? That's a little church joke. If you get that, you're a church person. I don't know how that's going to go the rest of the day, but I thought I'd use it here. <laughs> right? These are folks who come to church looking for, what do you have for me? And now, i got to tell you, there's a place in all of us where we say, what do you have for me? Where we say, I'm in need, and the only person who meets that need is Jesus. That is salvation. That is the thing that God does for us that we could not do for ourselves. That is the reason Jesus went to the cross, to serve us, because we could not do it. We owed a debt we could not pay, and he paid a debt he did not owe. And so for us, there is a place indeed to remember that God has done something for us that we cannot do for ourselves. But as we come to know that Christ, as we discover our salvation, it leads us to be people who want to be sanctified, who not only know the Christ who died on the cross, but the Holy Spirit who says, now become like Him, live like Him, serve like Him. Uh, Our original sin is natural self-centeredness. Original sin is our natural sense of saying, you know what, I want to do what it is that I want to do. How does this affect me? Oh, i got to tell you, when I get hungry, I get mean. There's nothing that brings out self-centeredness in me more than being hungry. I, I want to tell you, if you want to know one of the ways to fight sin, you just make sure you eat more, right? I don't, I don't know exactly how that works. I'm not sure that's a biblical principle, but I, it works in my life, Right? Because when I come home and I'm hungry and there's nobody there, I think, ah, oh, oh, why doesn't somebody serve me, right? And say, God, 
Help me to understand what's happening in the lives of others. Help me figure out how do I serve others. It happens where you work. It happens in our community. It happens in our country. For followers of Christ to rise to the place where we can share the kingdom, we must be people who continue to go back and understand that Christ has come not only to forgive that original sin, but then to to make us people who are willing to say, move me into a place where I look to what it is that you want me to do. Where can I serve? Where can I serve best is a direction prayer. If you want to know, should I start or stop? Should I stay or should I go? Perhaps the prayer that precedes any of that particular word from God is a prayer that says, God, where can I serve best? Or how can I serve best? Or who do I serve best? Not all of us in this room serve in all of the same ways. Everyone in this room has a different way to serve. Uh, Martha Jennings was married to uh, a United Methodist pastor. Right? So when you read her obituary, you're going to see a number of places where she lived, a whole list of places. Right? That whole list of places is because the bishop kept moving her and her husband around while he served. She would uh, teach or uh, take up uh, any number of uh, ways to serve the community. Now, on their tombstone, the one phrase that is written behind, behind Martha and her husband's name is they sang in the choir, right? That was their favorite thing. Now, I'll be honest, I don't, I don't necessarily think of seeing Martha out there in the congregation. I think of, of seeing Martha up here in the choir. That's where she served best. It's where she found her greatest joy. In our lives, can you imagine putting something on your tombstone right now that says where you serve best? Could you imagine if that was a requirement? Will will you ask yourself, what should I put about the sum of my life? Right? Pastor Jim, he was mean when he was hungry. No, that's, that is not what I want on my obituary. Don't put that on my tombstone. What, What is it that we should put? How well do you know Christ? That's the pursuit of our mission. How well do you know Christ and how well do you make him known? Now, I went to three years down at Asbury Seminary, a wonderful learning institution, a great place to be, a great heritage of holiness and Methodist preaching and Wesleyan schooling. It was a great place and still is a great school. I recommend it. I went there in my first year and I discovered that generally I didn't like going to class all the time. Just a heads up. They wanted to put all sorts of stuff in my brain. They wanted me to do all sorts of homework and quite frankly I wanted to go into ministry. Sitting through class all day was getting long and boring and uh, I was getting a little angry and I was getting poor on top of all that. So I needed to find somebody who would help me. So uh, I, went to, uh, I went to the Golden Arches, right? The Golden Arches always needs workers. So there's a Golden Arches about 20 miles north there in Nicholasville up from Asbury Seminary. And I said, I'm over 18. They said, great, you can work nights because they always need people to work nights, you know, so always an opening. So I worked at the Nicholasville McDonald's from 9 p.m. until about 1 a.m. through the course of the week. On weekends, I went up to see Karen and then had to drive back home every weekend, right? That's eventually why we got married. This is working out well. Let's do this, you know, let's figure this out. So, but for a year, I worked at the Nicholasville McDonald's while I was going to seminary. I don't remember anything about seminary in my first year, except the fact that I worked at McDonald's. Right? Because at McDonald's, I was there from 9 to 1, and it was intense. You know what I learned at McDonald's? I learned that I had to say please and thank you every time. Right? I would like 12 Big Macs, please. 12 Big Macs? 12 Big Macs. Thank you. I can make Big Macs, too. Right? That, that's, that, that lesson has done me better in churches than obviously anything I learned at seminary. I learned that when a bus rolls up, you just shut your mouth and start cooking hamburgers. (laughs) Right? You don't need to complain. If a bus rolls up, everybody's thinking the same thing. Stupid bus. (laughs) 
I learned if you walk in at 12.55 a.m., five minutes before we close, and after I've got the grill cleaned up, you know what I used to do? I cook another hamburger. Now, there was one other fella there who was working with me at that McDonald's. He worked there full time, 40 hours a week. He worked there in order to provide for his family. And because he could get health insurance through McDonald's, he worked there all the time. Now, go ahead and flip because this is not, that was not, there it is, right? I, I want to tell you that Seminary is not where I learned the most important stuff about ministry. It was from 9 to 1, in the back grill of McDonald's, where every night we cleaned off the grill and then wet mopped and then dry mopped the floor to make sure it was sparkling clean. That was important. And it was important to thy partner who was there full time taking care of his family. And he would sing church songs. He would sing Amazing Grace. And he would sing How Great Thou Art. And he would sing Old Spirituals. He was a wonderful uh, African-American brother who found that working at McDonald's was the place where he was going to uh, be sure that he could provide for his family. And so he was faithful and attendant, and he was uh, willing to follow through. He was patient and gracious. He never complained. He simply did everything that needed to be done every night faithfully. And in the midst of my confusion, learning all this stuff about God at seminary and trying to decide if I was going to get married and deciding where I was going in my life, that brother at McDonald's was a rock. Now, he never once talked theology with me. He didn't give me a single lesson about academic thoughts, but he served. That lesson was the most important one I learned in my first year of seminary. You don't have to necessarily think that everything you need to know about God has to go into our heads because sometimes the most important stuff are things that come out of our hearts. The disciples didn't understand what Jesus was doing. In fact, when Jesus sits down with them at the Last Supper, having told them, Matthew 20 precedes that discussion, by the way. Matthew 20 precedes the Last Supper. When Jesus then goes with them into Jerusalem and goes to the Last Supper, do you remember what it is the Gospel of John says a fight breaks out at the Last Supper? How do you like that? How's that for a good communion service? A fight breaks out at the Last Supper. And what are they fighting over? Who's the most important? And that's the moment when Jesus then gets up from the table and puts a towel around his waist and washes their feet. It is not simply about knowing how to quote your favorite Bible verse. It is also grasping the direction in life that God is taking us as a whole. Our self-centered nature rebels against this thought that we are called to serve. And yet when you know God, when you discover Christ as Savior, when you are filled with the Holy Spirit, then serving others, especially those who are in need, becomes a place that fulfills you. It becomes a place where you find, say, I find my joy in this. I find satisfaction in what I am doing. Now, learning how to be servants like that is part of the task that God has for us in our sanctification. We can learn at a church service, but we can also learn about being the church in serving. Not only do we learn about who God is as we read the word and study and pray and sing the hymns of the faith, but it is also, it is alongside of being the church, serving others. Serving them as brothers and sisters in Christ. Serving them as believers out in the community. How can you serve in the church? Where are places, if you are looking for satisfaction, if you are looking for ways to serve, I want to give you a few thoughts, a few directions. And here's where if you filled out that card earlier, you can write some of these down if they're of particular interest to you and turn them back into us. Uh, our youth begin back up on Wednesday nights, and on Wednesday nights uh, we serve a meal. One of the reasons our youth program is such a draw to some of those youth is because we feed them on, Thursday, on Wednesday nights. And we used to just feed a snack and occasionally do a meal, but one of the things we learned on Wednesday nights is that some of our youth come in need of a meal, and so every Wednesday night we feed a meal. You are invited to come 
and help be a part of that process. They will clean you out. They will enter into that room and take all of that juice that you've poured and all of that pop and that hot dog or chicken nuggets or whatever's on that table, and most of them, listen, most of them will be in such a rush to eat and hang out with their friends that they will not notice you serving them. A few will. A few are going to say thank you. Now, we need some folks who can drive. If you would like to drive the church van and pick up kids or then take kids back home afterwards, we would love to have some more drivers for the van. On Sunday morning, Bryce is always looking for people who are willing to run the, uh, the, the computer upstairs or the camera or the board, the soundboard. If you have ever once thought to yourself, why don't those words change quicker? Then God has called you to run the computer. I should get a lot of volunteers. Right? We can train you in how to do it, and it's not nearly as easy as you might think it is, but we can train you. We can show you how it all works. If you can play any musical instrument or want to sing, Bryce would love to talk to you about that and say, how does that look? How can we get you included and involved? All right? Jen in the back end for children's ministry is always looking for helpers, especially as our special needs program continues to grow. Uh, we need an adult sometimes who is simply willing to be with one child, maybe even to go to class with that child. You get to go to class with them. You don't have to teach the class. You don't have to do anything. You just have to go with them. And in times where they get agitated or frustrated, be there to say, you know what, let's pay attention to the activity. Let's focus on what we're doing. If you want to teach the threes or the fours at 10 or 11, 15, if you just want to help sign in new families at the new sign-in station, if you want to be a part of helping to lead in the summer, we're looking for a few folks who would be summer leaders so that our teachers who teach from September through May could then have time with uh, their families uh, through the summer in June, July, and August. If you'd be willing to teach uh, 12 weeks of Sunday school, especially at the 10 o'clock hour, Jen would love to talk to you. Uh, we're going to start up Kids Club in, in February 11th, and we're looking particularly for grade 3-4 leaders. We say that because Jeff and Lori Pickett normally lead that particular group, but their son Mason was in a serious car accident uh, the day before Christmas. And so Mason continues to be at home and be under physical therapy. And Jeff and Lori have been incredibly faithful for years on Sunday nights. They haven't even said they won't do it yet, but we'd like to be prepared and make sure we've got leaders in case they say it's just too much. Uh, Joyce in small groups is always looking for people who will host a group or lead a group or be a part of a group, who will volunteer their home for a small group, people who are willing to connect others and be able to say, God, I'm willing to be one of those people who helps connect others. Uh, I, don't know, I don't know that many of you will know uh, Julius uh, when we talk about him, Julius, who died on Friday, but I did. Uh, Julius joined the church. He was baptized by Dave Roach about uh, 12 years ago. And Julius and Alicia live just back here behind the church uh, in the house there. Julius sits right there. And last Sunday, during greeting time, it just happened, he was here by himself. So I spent a few mo moments, said hello to Julius, and told him I was glad to see him. Right? We don't all have to know everybody, but everybody should make it their job to make sure we get to know each other better and deeper and richer. So that as a church, as we grow and as we walk with one another through all that happens in life, we can serve one another in the midst of it. And we're always glad to have folks volunteer for Upward to help set up chairs. If you'd like to be part of a chair team, every chair team would be willing to have somebody. Listen, every chair team. When there are three guys here for the chair team, they do it faithfully. They'll do it for half an hour. If we had ten guys here, it would take us three minutes. And you'd think to yourself, I don't even know why I came, because it only took us three minutes. And we'd love to have you. Uh, you could help be part of the media team upstairs. You could help serve meals on Thursday evenings. If you just wanted to be the spill cleaner upper, you could just glare at people who spill their coffee, just sit right beside them and shake your head at, no, that's not what that means. <laughs> That means we got the buckets and the rags and you want to, you know, because that's just what it takes. Just what it takes. Those upward people, man, if you want to be just a spill cleaner upper on Saturdays, you know, you just come in. Because if you come in 
you know, after we've worked all day, you know what happens to me? Again, at the end of eight hours of Upward and I see a spill, I think to myself, ah, I'm hungry. We need somebody who comes in gracious and loving, says, Jesus, I clean up this spill in your name. That's things we do in the church. There are also things we do as the church. Because I don't want to just guilt you into doing things here because while we love each other here, we don't spend a lot of time, we don't spend most of our time here. We spend most of our time out there and with our family and with our friends, with our coworkers, and in a crazy world. I've got Susie up there in the spring. Uh, this, is, this is for you. It's, it's also for the 10 o'clock service especially. Susie is uh, my favorite person who starts to show up here this next uh, eight weeks before we celebrate the resurrection. Right? Susie means scoot up and scoot in evangelism. Right? So especially at 10 o'clock, we start running out of seats. And I know it's a small thing, but don't make visitors sit in the front row. Don't make visitors sit in the front row. Don't make visitors sit in the front row. I'll say that again the next hour, but man, it's just one of the ways we serve people. And I know it's hard because you're closer to me and I spit on you and I apologize. (laughs) You can find those ways where you're called to serve because it's hard, it's tiring. But we pray for one another and we find the Holy Spirit fills us with energy that we don't have for ourselves. That's part of why we worship. It's part of how we uh, work in our marriages, part of how we deal with our children, part of how we maintain ourselves as followers of Christ is when we remind ourselves that it is not our effort, it's His power. It is not our grace, it is His. Uh, Up here at the altar rails, we've got a whole bunch of these window clings. You can put them anywhere you want. Maybe you're going to put them on your dishwasher or your washing machine, or in your car, or at your door, wherever it is that you might see God's symbol, the cross, in the midst of this symbol of your divine direction, those places where God has called you to be. I'm going to put a prayer up here, and we're going to pray this final prayer out loud. Maybe it's exactly the prayer that you need to pray, and to make sure you don't pray it alone, we're all going to pray it together. And so as we get ready to sing our final hymn, would you take a look up here and we'll pray this prayer together. God, thank you for serving me. You have given me your love and life. Where can I serve you best? Help me hear your divine direction. Amen.